I know what to, you know, how to defeat the, their narrative. Now, again, dinosaurs are used more than anything else to pull people away from God's Word and from the Bible. And the reason why they're so compelling is that they're interesting. They're fun. And they are marvelous to look at and think about. I mean, who would not want to just sit there and be looking, staring at these majestic creatures for long periods of time? You don't want to look at them? Stare at them? <laughs> Again, so, yeah, I mean, they are wonderful creatures. They're fascinating. They're not like anything else that we see in the world today. They are completely different. So... Of course, people are drawn to dinosaurs in many respects. Now, dinosaurs are shown to kids and adults in books and movies, documentaries, captivating them with vivid images while indoctrinating them with evolutionary ideas. You have a lot of books like this right here, where you got the Good Manners Dinosaur, Digging for Dinosaurs, I Can Read About Dinosaurs, The Age of the Dinosaurs etc etc all these kids books geared towards them but guess what the, some of the first few lines are in those books 150 to 250 million years ago or millions and millions of years ago and whatnot so you have this idea being put in their mind at a very early age that is contrary to God's word and you also have various movies and stuff that are geared towards kids as well as adults Again, Land Before Time. Who remembers Land Before Time? Yeah. One of, and I love those movies and stuff. Why? Because I was fascinated with dinosaurs. Uh, We're Back. That was one of my favorite movies, and most people don't even really remember too much. A uh, time traveler brings dinosaurs back from the past into the present day and everything. Of course, you got The Good Dinosaur. I haven't seen that one yet. We got Ice Age, Don the Dinosaurs, again, the TV show Dinosaurs. Anybody remember that one? Yeah. I watched that when I was a kid, too, because, again, fascinated with dinosaurs. And, of course, Jurassic Park and all those as well. But, again, what? They are pushing these evolutionary ideas. And, again, and they are get, the world is not going to give people a biblical framework. They're not going to teach people what the Bible says. They're going to teach them whatever they want them to think. So they are going to push their agenda and again, drawing people away from God. And everyone is bombarded with these images and ideas their whole life, and so much so that they begin to believe what they're seeing. You cannot watch any type of documentary about the earth or this or that and everything without at one point them going, well, this was created 550 million years ago, or this rock right here is 50 million years old or this or that, they want to throw in these ideas just wherever they can, sneak them in a little bit at a time, so that you are slowly but surely brainwashed into thinking what they want you to think. So how did dinosaurs get here? How did dinosaurs end up getting here according to evolution? Well, first let's look at their timetable. So here we have... Basically, their idea of how dinosaurs came through. And the Mesozoic era is pretty much where a lot of people tend to place the dinosaurs in the evolutionary worldview. You have the Triassic period, the Jurassic period, and the Crustaceous period are the main ones. So most of us are fairly familiar with Jurassic because of the Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, and all those things. Triassic, again, might be a little bit familiar as well. Cretaceous, maybe, maybe not. But again, these are the areas where, again, we tend to see dinosaurs in the evolutionary idea. Now, dinosaurs are said to have began their rule about 240 to 250 million years ago. But here's the thing. Can an animal actually rule over anything? <laughs> All right, well, cats maybe, but they're about the only animal that could. But dinosaurs really didn't rule anything. Why? They didn't have a kingdom. There's no way that they could actually rule anything. But they always like to say, dinosaurs ruled the earth at this point in time. Basically trying to show again they were the dominant thing on the earth. 
But they supposedly began about 240, 250 million years ago. That's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So they supposedly evolved from small dog-like or horse-like animals. So again, they supposedly ended up evolving from horse the animals about the size of a horse, which that's not too small, or a dog. That's a lot of variation in size and whatnot, unless you have a big dog. Some big dogs are about like the size of a small horse. You ever seen a Great Dane in person? Whoo, uh, Scooby-Doo. Hmm. He's a Great Dane. So, anywho, so, yeah, so, again, they claim that they evolved from animals about the size of a dog to that of a horse and everything. So, you know, getting these giant things evolving from these smaller things. However, there are no fossils that show evolutionary progression into dinosaurs. Again, we actually do not find any of this. All the dinosaurs that are found in early layers are full-blown dinosaurs with no transitional forms. So every time we find dinosaurs in the ground, they're not in the middle of changing from one thing to another. They are full-fledged dinosaurs. You'd think if evolution is true, we'd find a whole bunch of things that were slowly going from a cat to a dog to a bird to this to that or whatever. But yet we don't. All the fossils we find, not just the dinosaurs, but all the fossils we find are what? Just as they are today. They are basic animals. We can tell that's a cat, that's a dog, that's a horse, whatever, based off of the fossils. There are no transitional forms whatsoever. And you'd think you'd find some. I mean, they live in millions and millions of years. You'd think that you'd find at least one, but they haven't found any. So, again, it is believed by the evolutionary or evolutionists, again, that you have this one lizard called a silosaurid. Whew, that's a word. Silosaurid. Again, it's basically like this medium sized, very leggy, long lizard. And that is supposed to be kind of the ancestor to dinosaurs. So, just kind of imagine a long a snake with very long legs. And everything, and boom, they pretty much got what you're looking for, all right? So they're claiming that these lizards end up being the ancestors to the dinosaurs. The problem is, in their view, for evolution, between the silosaur, or silosaur, uh, I said it a while ago, silosaurids, there you go, and the dinosaurs, there's a gap about, about 10 to 15 million years between them. And as we said, there are no transitional forms from one to the other, so we don't really see this progression from this thing to that thing. Again, we're looking at their view. We're not looking at the truth or God's view. We're just looking at what they say. And even in their narrative, they do not have enough of the pieces put together to really show that this actually happened. It's all speculation. That's one of the key things with evolution, that it's all guesswork. It's all speculation with a lot of it. So, so let's see here. So secular paleontologists believe that this one animal that we have right uh, we're fixing to pop up here uh, called a Naesosaurus. Naesosaurus, something like that. Now I have hard time with some of these names they claim that this ends up being kind of the missing link between the salasaurids salis and the dinosaurs but the problem is that when they found it they only found a few bones they found an arm bone a few vertebrae and maybe a tooth or two and through that very limited number of things that they found they created an entire animal out of it man they're good I mean, they could tell what that animal's tail looked like, its head looked like, its back legs looked like, just from a few pieces of vertebra and one arm bone. Man, they're a lot smarter than I am. Do I? Yeah, very creative in that. 
So what we got to remember with a lot of these forms, a lot of these things, is that many of these artists' drawings and representations are artistic viewpoints. These are people who have been paid to draw these things in certain ways to prove their point. And so basically they're left up to the artist's imagination. How can you sit there and make this look like an animal that will fit our viewpoint? That is something that they do a lot. So again, you have a lot of imagination that took place to get the animal drawn from the fossils that are found here. Right? I mean, it takes a lot of creativity to get from maybe six to eight different pieces of bone that have nothing to do with all of it and build this animal out of it. That's some creativity there. So let's define what a dinosaur is. So dinosaurs, we tend to think of all giant lizards as dinosaurs, right? And everything, but they're not all actually dinosaurs. So dinosaurs are classified based on their hip structures. So you have two different types of dinosaurs, and again, they're based on their hip structures. And I'm going to use these to kind of help me out here. So... Our two different hip structures, we have what are called the lizard-hipped dinosaurs and the bird-hipped dinosaurs. The reason why we call them that is about how the joints in the hips end up working and moving. So the lizard-hipped dinosaurs would be like this one right here, where the hips end up allowing for forward motion from the hip joint. The bird-hipped dinosaurs... And actually, this is lizard-hipped as well. This one is lizard-hipped. I actually got it backwards there. So again, they go from, again, the hips there, whatnot. Again, moving the feet forward. The bird-hipped ones, however, do not actually get to move their, from their hips. They actually move from their knees a lot. And so the brachiosaurus here, the triceratops, some of them are all considered bird-hipped because of the way they have to move their legs, because of the way their hips are formed and everything. So you have lizard-hipped and you have bird-hipped dinosaurs. So again, this one actually is a lizard-hipped one. And I believe this one ends up classifying more as a, a bird-hipped. And which one looks more like a bird to you? Neither one, hopefully neither one of them, right? So again, so we classify them based on the hip structures and stuff. So dinosaurs not only classify by their hip structures, but they are basically land-dwelling, walking reptiles. Their hip structures allow their bodies to be raised above the ground with their legs underneath them. So unlike reptiles we have today, like alligators and crocodiles, they have legs, but what? They're off to the sides. All right. They're not directly underneath them. And most lizards that we see today, most of their legs actually shoot out to the side and everything. So most of their bodies are very low to the ground. Dinosaurs have their legs where they're directly underneath them, so it raises their bodies up off the ground a good way, like you see with these right here. As we said a while ago, again, they are all land-dwelling reptiles and walking reptiles. So a dinosaur walks on dry land and their bodies are lifted up off of the ground by their le legs being directly underneath them. That's how dinosaurs were classified by Sir Richard Owen who was the first person to actually identify them in the 1800s. But what about water dinosaurs and stuff? Well they're technically not dinosaurs. We like to, in layman's terms, the general people, we tend to claim that they're all dinosaurs, but they're technically not. Okay, again, these are technically dinosaurs. These are not. These are marine reptiles. A lot of times we like to say that they are water dinosaurs, just to kind of let everybody understand what they are. But they're actually marine reptiles. And you have various types of them. The plesiosaur is one of the most common ones. It looks like this, but it has flippers instead of legs. So, 
Again, you have a lot of big ones. If you watch Jurassic Park, especially Jurassic World, they have some of these really big, nasty things. You see the one where they have the big dinosaur come up like a dolphin and grab something out of the meat off the hook or whatever in Jurassic World, the first one. So, yeah, so they end up showing some of these quite well there. So you have water, reptiles and stuff there, sea dinosaurs. Again, they lived in the oceans or waters and stuff. They also have pterosaurs. Pterosaurs are your flying reptiles, the ones with the wings and everything. Again, they got one right up there laughing at everybody. I would say it looks like that one's laughing. But you have your pterosaur again. So the pterodactyl is one of the ones most people tend to know about and so far as a pterosaur goes. But again, they're the flying reptiles. They usually have big wingspans. Their wings are made out of a thick, leathery skin membrane versus feathers. And they don't technically fly, they glide and everything. They don't actually have the ability to fly, per se, but they can glide quite a bit across the way. So again, now the crazy thing is, is that according to the paleontologists, people who dig up the dinosaur bones and whatnot, not all dinosaurs actually lived at the same time. So they actually believe that there are various groups of dinosaurs that live in different ages. We tend to just kind of clump them all together. They all live together. But in the evolutionary worldview, they all have, they're layered where they're not all around together. And as you can kind of see here, they got them all kind of grouped right there into certain things. So T-Rex is not going to be going after the stegosaurus. All right, so that's not going to happen in, according to their viewpoint. So the big question is, though, what happened to the dinosaurs according to the evolutionists? What happened to them? Well, I can already tell you what happened to them. I told you a while ago. What, what happened to the dinosaurs? They died, right? And they all died. But evolutionists want to come up with theories of why they are no longer here. And there are currently 16 evolutionary theories as to what caused their extinction. So you have 16 different ideas as to how dinosaurs went kaput millions and millions and millions of years ago. So let's look and see what some of these are. So the most common theory is that there was an asteroid that came through and landed around the Yucatan in Mexico and ends up having this big dust cloud and just, just wipes them all out because it ends up turning this tropical climate into a colder climate and reptiles can't survive and they died. So most everybody's probably heard of the asteroid, right, that killed the dinosaurs. Again, that's probably the number one thing they like to try to say. Do we have, have giant meteors hit the earth in the past? Yes, we have impact craters to show that yes, that has happened, but did it actually have that big of an effect? And it's hard to say. We weren't there, we can't tell you. Other people tend to think that it might be volcanoes that killed the dinosaurs. The whole lot of volcanic activity ends up, again, causing the warm temperatures of the planet to get colder. And eventually, again, the dinosaurs can't stand the cold and they end up dying. There's a common theme here, right? Going from a very warm climate to a very cold climate. Reptiles cannot stand in cold weather. We'll look at that a little bit more tomorrow as well when we look at warm-blooded versus cold-blooded for the bird thing. So we have, again, the volcanic activity. Different cause, same effect, right? The earth gets cooled off by all the volcanoes. And we know this does happen when volcanoes go off, that the areas around it start cooling off considerably by 10 to 15 degrees until all the stuff is, you know, dissipated. And there are some that think that, well, they all just got sick. The dinosaurs got an illness, they got sick. They didn't have masks, so they got COVID and died. Um, what not. Again, so there's some type of illness that went through, some type of disease that ends up killing them. You have some of them that argue that there was a giant supernova that happened fairly close to the earth and the radiation from the supernova hit the dinosaurs and they all got cancer and died that way. Yeah, it, it, get, it starts getting a little far-fetched, right? Oh, but wait, here's the best one. 
Recently, a British scientist basically stated that dinosaurs have gassed themselves into extinction. And it means exactly what it says, of what you imply. Because dinosaurs w cut wind way too much, and they ended up killing themselves. Now, I felt like I wanted to die around some people, but I don't think I've actually done it, you know. But I'm going to try to get away from them as quick as I could. But again, dinosaurs farted too much, basically. That's what they're, it, they're implying. And again, all, all the dinosaur farts ended up, again, changing the atmosphere, making it go from warm to cold and whatnot. See, that, remember in the 90s where we had all those studies about cow farts and moose burps and stuff? Yeah, that's where, that's where all that good education and scientific data goes to and whatnot. So, again, do you really think they have a clue about what really happened to the dinosaurs with all these different theories and as we go down the list again, it just gets more outrageous. So, okay. So the question ends up being, did dinosaurs really live millions of years ago? Did they actually live millions of years ago? Well, first thing we got to ask is, how do evolutionists get the ages of millions of years for dinosaurs? How do they figure this out? Well, evolutionists have various dating methods that they end up using. And so they end up using this thing called radiometric dating. So they are not actually dating the fossils, they're dating the rocks that the fossils are found in. So notice they're not dating the fossils, they're dating the rocks that are around the fossils. So the way radiometric dating works. So you have certain atoms called parent atoms. They are usually an unstable atom, something kind of like uranium or argon. And these atoms are in a constant state of flux until they break down into what are considered to be daughter atoms. And those daughter atoms are stable, which means they're not going to break down anymore. So you have these unstable parent atoms that turn into stable daughter atoms. Any unstable parents in here? You, you blame the kids, right? <laughs> so, but again, the, and what? So they become stable daughter atoms. Again, they're looking for not having that chaos going on inside them. They're trying to gain kind of peace and serenity, aren't we all? So the rate of decay from going to the parent atom to the daughter atom is called a half-life. And basically you can take, according to them, you can take the number of parent atoms and the number of daughter atoms and figure out what the ratio is, and you can determine how old something is based off of those two numbers. So the more daughter atoms you have versus parent atoms, the older the rock is said to be. If it has a lot of parent atoms and very few daughter atoms, it's considered to be very young. Everybody on board. Well, I don't really have pictures of the atoms themselves, but basically you just take an atom, it's unstable, and then it breaks down into two atoms, pretty much, and everything. So you have a parent, then usually two daughter atoms that come out of it. So here are some of the various thing, elements that they end up using to date things. So you have rubidium, 87. It claims to have a half-life of 50 billion years. They use this to test very old rocks. <laughs> you have thorium, three, uh, 232, which says to have a half-life of 13.9 billion years. Again, dating very old rocks. Uranium, 238, four and a half billion years. Old rocks and fossils are usually used with that one. Potassium, 40, 1.3 billion years. Old rocks and fossils. Uranium-235, there are different, you know, numbers or ions of various atoms and elements. 713 million years, old rocks, fossils. 
The one that most people might think of is carbon-14. It has a half-life of 5,700 years. It's the shortest one. And you, have, you can only use it to date things less than 50,000 years. After that, it cannot do anything else. The problem here is there are many, many problems with this line of dating of these rocks. There's a lot of problems with this. The first major problem we have with their dating methods is that we do not know what the original number of parent atoms were. We don't know what the original number of daughter atoms were or a combination of them when it started to decay. Maybe there were twice as many daughter atoms as there were parent atoms before it started to actually you know, fall apart, when it started decaying. We don't know. We don't, it's assumed that all the daughter atoms came from the parent atoms. But you cannot know that. It's impossible to know. So we don't know what we're starting with. Well, it's also assumed that the decay rate was, is constant. That it stays the same. It doesn't speed up or slow down. So again, they're arguing that the decay rate stays exactly the same over all this time. Nothing has sped it up, nothing has slowed it down. And the craziest thing is, is that the whole system is based on the predetermined geological column. See, way back in the 1800s into the early 1900s, before all these dating methods were used, these evolutionists and stuff created what they call the geological column, where they put various animals in different layers of the earth and say all right if it's in this age right or this area right here it's this old if it's down here it's a lot older than that and etc cetera, etc cetera. we kind of saw that when we on the first few slides where we looked at the different periods where evolutionists placed the dinosaurs that is a part of the geological column and the crazy thing is again radiometric dating would not have been feasible if geological column had not been erected first again this comes from an evolutionist so if it was not for the radiometric dating or sorry if it was not for the geological column then radiometric dating would not even be possible because they wouldn't know where to place things so are they really looking at the dating or are they actually looking at the column to make sure the things go where they want them to go that is the thing here. And the funny thing is that most people have actually figured this out against them, that they're using circular reasoning. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. That's what they do. They'll date the fossils by the rocks, and then they'll date the rocks by the fossils. Does that make a lot of sense? Not really. But what? It fits what they want it to say. And they won't tell you that up front. They'll say, well, this rock, they'll just use one of them over here and then another one over here. But they don't ever put them together. But if you take all of it together, you see that it's just a bunch of circular reasoning where they are just constantly going around and around, making it say what they want. And here's a crazy thing as well, that the geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply to this circular reasoning feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. So they don't care about trying to answer our questions about why they are dating the rocks with the fossils and the fossils with the rocks and just circular reasoning all this around because it's, it's a waste of their time pretty much to answer our questions. We're not smart enough to figure it out apparently. So they don't think that we can actually figure it out. So let's see here. Let me find where I'm at in my notes here. So there is actually an example showing that the, these radiometric dating does not actually work. An example of the results obtained is provided by the rock layer of volcanic origin at Bass Rapids in Grand Canyon which yielded the following age estimates. So basically they took a, one rock out of the Grand Canyon, same layer, they broke it up into pieces and sent it off to different labs to have, all the age, to have them all test them with various radiometric dating. How old can something be? Whatever the age is, right? Can it have multiple ages? 
It should only have one age, right? Well, let's look at the results that this one rock generated from all these different labs using different techniques. So the same rock was estimated to be 841 and a half million years using the potassium to argon method. Then it was considered to be 1,060 million years, so a little bit over a billion years, using rubidium and strontinium. Then another test said that that same rock was 1,250 million years old using uranium and lead. And then a fourth test said that, no, this rock is 1.379 billion years old, 1,379 million years. You have one rock, four different testing methods, four different ages. That rock has a sp identity disorder. <laughs> it can't figure out how old it is. These four methods should have yielded the same estimate of this volcanic rock layer because the decay for each of the four parent atoms all began at the same time when the volcanic rock layer formed. So since we had know exactly where the decay should have started, they all should be the same age with every test. But each test yielded different results on the same rock. So can we trust these dating methods if they're not accurate? No, of course not. In fact, using some, science, using some actually empirical science here, we find out that as much as 80% of the potassium in a small sample of an iron meteorite can be simply removed by soaking it in distilled water for four and a half hours. You can actually make it lose some of the properties that it has just by soaking it in water for a little bit of time. So can we trust again what people think about these decay rates and stuff no in conventional interpretation of potassium argon case for potassium AR argon age data it is common to discard ages that are substantially too high or too low compared to the rest of the group or with other available data such as the geological time scale so again, basically, if they test this rock and it's too old or too young, they just throw it out. If it's not where they think it should be, they just get rid of it. Oh, that didn't actually happen. We're going to pretend like that never happened at all. And they do this quite often. So let's use some empirical science to look at this in another way. So we got a candle. When was this candle lit? You walk into a room, you see a candle burning. When was the candle lit? Can you answer that question? Yeah, but when did that happen? But when? <laughs> but you see what I'm getting at. You don't actually know when that, you know it did happen, but when did it happen? That is the question. You know what happened. You're telling me what happened. You're not telling me when it happened. So, yeah, you should, but again, we're trying, again, comparing this to the ages of the minerals here. So let's say that we can, me can we measure the height of the candle at the moment? When we walk in the room, can we see how tall the candle is? Yeah, so the candle's about, let's say, seven inches tall. We can measure that. Can we sit there and watch the candle burn and see what the burn rate is from the time that we stepped in there? Yes. We can measure the rate of burn. Let's say one inch an hour, it ends up going down. All right. So based off of this, can we determine how old that candle is? Yeah, you have that as well. But again, do we know how tall the candle was when it started? Do we know when it was actually lit? We can measure all these things, and we can same thing with the rocks. We can measure all this stuff right now, but we actually don't know when the candle was lit based off of the evidence we have. Same thing with the rocks. We can measure the decay rates and stuff right now, but we don't actually know how old the rock actually is or where it started from. So again, there are various assumptions that are applied with this. So how tall was the candle? 
Is it 20 feet tall to start with, or is it just an inch above where it was where we went in there, where it started? Is that going to make your results a little bit different about how long it was burning? Yeah. And has it always burned at the same rate? So even though we measured it this way right now, was there more oxygen in the room a little bit before it made it burn faster? Or less oxygen make it burn slower? Did anybody ever put it out and start it back again? There's a lot of assumptions in this. So we actually do have scientific proof that dinosaurs did not actually live millions of years ago. You believe it or not, we actually have scientific proof that this did not happen. So again, they're basically, again, measuring these fossils by the age of the rock, but of course they're dating the rocks by the fossils as well. So what is some of the scientific proof that dinosaurs did not live all this time ago? So the fossilization process. All right, so how bones become fossils. All right. So bones generally will go through something called petrification. Basically, this is where a bone becomes a stone. All right. It turns into rock. So in order to get petrification to happen, the bones are rapidly buried, and then minerals go into the bone or whatever it is and turn it into a rock. And anything can be petrified. They've actually found a cowboy boot that's been petrified with the cowboy's foot still in it, and it's solid rock. They have found petrified baseball caps. They, you can petrify anything. There's actually a way now, uh, scientists, you can do little experiments. Look it up, kids, on the Internet. And you can make your own petrified whatever you want to. Just a few little things in there. Answers in Genesis has a cool little thing on there for kids to actually do that with. So it might be something fun to do in your own spare time. Turn stuff into rocks. That would be awesome, right? Everything. So again, it doesn't take much. But those minerals get down in there and it changes it and turns it into a solid rock. Okay? Now, it is assumed that most dinosaur bones have gone through the petrification process. So they've went from being a bone to a rock. I mean, come on, they've been, they were dead for millions of years. A bone won't last that long, right? It would actually break down, decay, rot, and turn to dust if it does not turn into stone. So it's assumed that most of the dinosaur bones we find in museums and stuff are all made of rock now, that they've been petrified, mortified terrified but here's some interesting things bones do not have to be turned into stone to be fossils and usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil most dinosaur fossils still actually have the actual bone it's not actually turned into rock well after millions of years how did that bone survive how did it not turn into dust Here's a more spectacular example. It was found in the north slope of Alaska where many thousands of bones lack any significant degree of per permineralization, basically fossilization. They did not turn into rock. The bones look and feel like old cow bones, kind of like this one right here. I think that's an old cow bone. I'm not sure. And the discoverers of the site did not report it for 20 years. Because they assumed that these bones were of bison and not dinosaur bones. But these were all dinosaur bones. They found this huge pile of dinosaur bones in Alaska that were bone. Not rock, bone. And again, they looked like old cow bones. The people knew about it for 20 years, didn't even bother telling anybody about it because again, they thought it was bison and not dinosaur. But they were turned out to be dinosaur bones. How can bone, again, last millions and millions of years without turning into dust? It can't. Here's another one. One of the things that we have is a part of a hip, bo the hip bone or pelvis of a dinosaur. Now this specimen actually looks like it came from an animal that looks like it died two or three hundred years ago. So again, talking about a dinosaur fossil they found. So again, they're saying that this pelvis and hip bone looks like that it died only two or three hundred years ago. However, this doesn't actually mean it died two or three hundred years ago. 
Because in Montana, this person here has seen dinosaur bones that look like they've come from animals that only died that long ago. And this guy knows very well that they died much longer than that. It gives a suggestion that Megalania may have been alive fairly recently. This is the evolutionist talking about the dinosaur bone discoveries he had. Basically he says, even though the bones look like they're only two or three hundred years old, oh no, we know better, because dinosaurs lived hundreds of millions of years ago and died then. So they're not two or three hundred, they're hundreds of millions of years old. They're not two or three hundred years old, even though that's what they look like. And if you go by the assumption of just looking at it, it makes it look like the dinosaur they found lived fairly recently. Again, how can bones survive millions of years without turning into dust? In northwestern Alaska in 1969, a geologist found a bed of dinosaur bones in unpermineralized uh, un or unfossilized condition. Again, they found a whole bunch of dinosaur bones, again, not turned into stone. No, this is in Alaska. As far as I know, there's a bunch of just permafrost in Alaska and, and tundra. So along the banks of the Colville River in west of Prudhoe Bay in um, oh, AK, Some Alaska, yeah, there it is. Um, my brain's not working. So frozen dinosaur bones were found that are as light as balsa wood and look as fresh as yesterday's dog bones. Their structure was porous, and the fossils were not mineralized at all. So they can actually look in there and they can see the porousness of the bones. They're so fresh, it looks like a dog just got done eating on it yesterday. How could that last millions of years? A report on the amazing preservation of the bones of a duck-billed dinosaur found in Montana stated that under a microscope, Looking at this young duck-billed dinosaur, the fine structure of the bone was able to be seen and has been preserved to such an extent that the cell characteristics can be compared to cells of chicken bones. So you can take this duck-billed dinosaur and you can look at it under a microscope and you can actually see the cells of the bone structure. And you can compare that to other Animals. It wasn't just chicken bones they compared it to, mammals and other things they compared it to, a bunch of stuff. How do cell structures last millions and millions of years? Logic says they don't. Here's one for you as well. A thin slice of T. rex bone glowed amber beneath the lens of my microscope. Blood vessel channels snaked through a bone matrix in tiny chambers known as la lacunae, which house bone-forming cells, appeared as small ovals. Then a colleague comes over and took one look at these things and shouted, You've got red blood cells! You've got red blood cells! So what happened here was they had a T-Rex thigh bone. They are trying to dig it up, it was stuck in the ground, so they did an unconventional thing. They, grabbed, they tied it up with a crane, tried to yank it out. It broke. Well, they took it back to the lab, the broken piece and whatnot, and lo and behold, in the middle of that is soft tissue. You have soft tissue of where the bone marrow used to be, still stretchy, and they even saw red blood cells underneath the microscope. How on earth does soft tissue not rot and degrade over millions of years? It does not. Let me see where I'm at here. So again, so you have that soft tissue that is found inside the bone. But that's not the only account of soft tissue. In fact, they're finding more and more soft tissue in dinosaurs all over the place. While at a dig at Hell Creek Formation in Montana, the scientist Mark Armitage came under the largest triceratops horn ever unearthed at the site. So he had a huge triceratops horn that he found. 
While examining the horn under a high-powered microscope back at the university he was at, Armitage was fascinated to see the soft tissue. They actually found soft tissue in that huge dinosaur or that huge triceratops horn. The discovery stunned members of the scientific community because it indicates that dinosaurs roamed the earth only thousands of years in the past rather than going extinct 60 million years ago. The guy who actually found this, he was a Christian. And when he discovered this, his colleagues, who are all evolutionists, basically got him fired. Because they're like, we're not going to let you bring your God into our lab by arguing that this soft tissue is recent. When he discovered that soft tissue, he didn't even have to make any interpretation. As soon as he found soft tissue, they went out of their way to discredit him and to get him fired. Does that sound very scientific and very open-minded? Not really. But again, soft tissue, how does it last millions and millions of years without rotting and decaying? It doesn't. So here, there's another one. Here we report a remarkable mummified specimen of the hadrosaurid dinosaur. There's your Latin name for it. I'm not even going to try that. And from the latest Cretaceous Lapidi Formation in Alberta, Canada, that preserves the three-dimensional cranial crest or comb composed entirely of soft tissue. So this one was a dinosaur that had one of these little crest things on top of its head. They actually found the entire crest, and it was all made of soft tissue, 100%. Yeah, kind of like the you know turkey or chicken thing up here at the top and whatnot. But again, but this is all made of skin, right? It's not made of feathers or anything like that. It's all skin, and it's very hard and stuff. They, um, they think they might use it for mating. We don't know yet. But anyway, so you have this big crest thing, and it's all made of soft tissue. There's not any type of fossilization that happened. It's all 100% soft tissue. Again, how does soft tissue last 60 million years? It doesn't. Can it last a few hundred, maybe a thousand, possibly? Do what? Yeah. Mummies and stuff still have soft tissue sometimes too. Humans. So again, a lot of these things cannot survive millions of years. Again, there's no way to really survive millions of years. And evolutionists, instead of going, well, we might be wrong, go, well, you know, maybe uh, instead of we're being wrong, maybe there's something that's going on we don't fully understand. Because we know this is millions and millions of years old. We know it's millions and millions of years old. So... There has to be something that keeps this soft tissue around for millions of years. We just got to find it. Now, is that a little bit, is that kind of stretching things a little bit? Pun intended. So evolutionists have tried to explain this away by arguing that iron that is found in hemoglobin will stabilize the soft tissue. Hemoglobin, of course, is made up, or helps to make up the red blood cells and such. So, again, they're saying that there's iron that's in the hemoglobin, and that ends up offering stability to the soft tissue. And so that's how it ends up living or surviving for millions of years. The problem is, when they ran this test, the amount of iron that they used in their experiments was, were many times higher than what can actually be found in hemoglobin. They supercharged everything with iron to make it actually work instead of actually going with the numbers of what actually it would have naturally. So they injected a whole bunch of iron into it to where they can make it prove their point. They did not actually look at the natural production of hemoglobin. So the problem is, again, not with the evidence that we have, but the evolutionists refused to acknowledge uh, what's right in front of them you have all this soft tissue you have bones that are not fossilized and yet they still want to claim dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years ago common sense tells us that those things would not last millions of years and therefore 
Dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago. You have soft tissue being found, like I said a while ago. But evolutionists refuse to give up their worldview. They, are one, they continue to push this agenda and push this idea and trying to make sure that their idea is the main idea that everybody believes. So again, instead of looking at what's right in front of them, again, they ignore it because it contradicts what they believe. So everybody's like, well, why don't they actually believe? Because they don't want to believe. Why does anybody not believe what the Bible says? Because they choose not to believe it. Same thing with these scientists. So tomorrow we're going to look at, did the dinosaurs really turn into birds? All right, we're going to look into that tomorrow.